Hi, I'm Mark Beiser. I'm a professor in the Department of French and Italian at the University of Texas at Austin. And what I'm about to talk about is as much the genealogy of a research topic as about the explanation of what I'm working on right now. And one of the advantages of reaching the rank of full professor is that you have the freedom to explore bolder approaches than were previously possible, say when you were uh, an assistant professor or an associate professor when they were time constraints. Now, I began with an interest in cognitive approaches to literature, in particular in representations of decision making in literature, and in studying the relationship between such representations and critical junctures in history. A, a genre in which decision making figures prominently is tragedy. In certain kinds of tragedies, protagonists face intractable situations and have to choose between two outcomes, each of which is equally unacceptable, such as in um, Aeschylus's Agamemnon. I decided initially to focus on tragedy itself, and then I became fascinated with this uh, focus on decision making because it seemed like some texts featuring decision making seemed tragic and yet weren't explicitly identified as tragedies. So I formulated a hypothesis about the history of tragedy that, uh, and a kind of an argument that tragedy couldn't just be seen as existing in 5th century Athens and 17th century France and England, and that there was a tragic consciousness that existed even during periods when theatrical tragedy was not supposed to have existed, such as the Middle Ages. Now, I, as I explored this topic, I found that it was a difficult argument to support because here I am trying to define tragic consciousness in a way that isn't necessarily explicitly uh, present in texts or explicitly developed in texts, and yet um, then I'm purporting to find the evidence for this tragic consciousness in text, so it's a little bit of a tautology. But, so I was stuck for a while, and being stuck is not, not easy, but last spring I had a bit of a breakthrough as I was reading um, a novel that had just appeared by the well-known French novelist uh, Michel Houellebecq. And this has been a very tumultuous and indeed tragic year in, in France, uh, as everyone knows, um, because uh, in last January there was the slaying of journalists at the satirical French weekly Charlie Hebdo, and then only two months ago there were the massacres in, in, in Paris. So, uh, it so it so happened that uh, Welbeck's novel Submission appeared on the very day when the journalists at Charlie Hebdo were, were killed. And it depicts a presidential election in France set a few years in the future where uh, the, social, the French Socialist Party concludes a pact with uh, the Islamic Party in order to prevent the far-right Nationalist Front Party from winning the elections. And they win, the coalition wins, and then the Islamic Party isn't interested in most of the ministerial posts, but uh, names its own, uh, one chooses the minister to the National Ministry of, of Education, and then uh, little by little the entire educational system in France becomes Islamic. And so uh, the, no the novice talks about uh, female students at the Sorbonne are now wearing veils, and, and professors who don't convert to Islam have to, have to leave. Uh, but it, interestingly enough, this solution in a satirical fashion is portrayed as uh, uh, solving France's social problems. And the, no the title of the novel, Submission, plays on the literal meaning of Islam, which is submission. So my realization was that it seemed like one could look at the history of French thought on submission through literature, where it kind of forms an arc, moving from the beginnings with the, with the Song of Roland, in which the Saracens who inhabit Spain in the 8th century are forced to submit to Christianity, and then ending with Welbeck's novel, where the French who are nominally Catholic submit to Islam. And the connection between the idea of submission and religious conflict in France was very strong in French history. Just to cite one example, the idea of submission is very much discussed during the wars of religion in early modern France, which is my specialty, where a proto-Protestant thinker, Etienne de la Boétie, discusses in his treatise on voluntary servitude why people voluntarily submit to a monarch and to authority, and his answer is out of habit. And uh, then later, his friend Michel de Montaigne, who wrote the essays, uh, who was writing them in the thick of the wars of religion, uh, later argued in favor of submission to a monarch and to God as the only way to put an end to internecine conflict. Now, you'll note that I've 
throughout this discussion, I've been talking about tragedy, and I've been fascinated by tragedy, and I found a way to connect this topic with tragedy, because in certain tragedies, the protagonist meets a terrible fate or is punished for uh, the refusal to submit, such as uh, Sophocles' Antigone. And I call the arguments in favor of submission the anti-tragic impulse, and therefore the title of my study is Submission and the Anti-Tragic Impulse in France, 1100 to 2015. Thank you.